final screencast for chapter 6 and in section 6.3 we are going to focus on the idea of biodiversity. Now the idea of diversity simply means to look at the different types of something and in this case we're going to be looking at the different types of living things that you would find on this planet. So the book definition for biodiversity is the variety of different organisms that you're going to find within a defined ecosystem. And this variety of organisms could include animals, could include plants, it could include bacteria, it could include fungus, or any other type of living organism that you would find on Earth. And in fact, biodiversity is actually one of the Earth's greatest natural resources. Now, when you think about biodiversity, one word that often comes to mind is the idea of extinction. Because, of course, if we lose one of these organisms, we definitely would lose one of our natural resources. And who knows what that resource could do for us in the future. So to define extinction is where you are actually talking about a species that has completely disappeared from all parts of its range. Now before an organism goes extinct, oftentimes we will classify an organism as being endangered. And an organism that is considered endangered is a species whose population size is declining, usually really rapidly, in a way that places it in danger of extinction. So there are many threats to biodiversity, but typically one of the first threats that comes to most people's minds is the idea of hunting. Hunting typically will put a great demand for um, various wildlife because you can use that wildlife to produce different types of products. And it's not necessarily saying that hunting is a bad thing, but you have to consider why you are hunting. And then if you do decide to hunt, you have to consider are you overdoing it? Because if you hunt to the extreme, then you can definitely push many species to the brink of extinction. So another threat that we need to consider when it comes down to the great variety of organisms that we have on our planet is how often we do actually pollute our environment. Simply the introduction of any harmful materials into the biosphere, whether it be through land, air, or water, can have a significant impact on the variety of organisms that we have on this planet. Now oftentimes this pollution is going to be a result of various different types of human activities. Um, the release of toxic compounds and these toxic compounds collecting in animal tissues. Um, the idea of introducing various herbicides or pesticides into the environment unfortunately can eventually find their way into the different organisms that inhabit Earth. Now what happens is when you introduce those different toxic compounds into the environment they can be magnified and typically when you magnify something you increase the concentration of that particular toxic substance in that organism or in organisms that may feed on that organism. So we call that biological magnification and this occurs when the concentration of a harmful substance increases in organisms at each higher trophic level in the food chain. So over here on the right is a really good example of biological magnification. There are many times where we worry about the concentration of mercury in the various fish products that we do consume. And what's interesting is that that mercury actually originates in the water that fish might live in. Now, if you think about it, when we talked about the energy pyramids, we sort of thought about the idea of the 10% rule, which was basically you pass on only about 10% of that original energy to the next trophic level. Well, the unfortunate thing is, when you introduce various toxins into the environment, you don't simply introduce only 10%. You actually introduce into the next trophic level the entire amount of um, toxin into that next trophic level. So, for instance, if you have mercury that's found in the water, all of that mercury will find its way into the plankton, which are those very super tiny microscopic animals that you find in this particular um, ecosystem. And then, of course, all of the mercury that you find in the plankton is going to find its way into the aquatic insects. Now, again, if these aquatic insects eat a huge amount of this mercury, all of that mercury is going to be collected within these insects. And, then of course, the insect-eating fish are going to consume these insects. And so the amount of mercury that you would find at each succeeding trophic level is going to continue to increase. And like we had said, mercury is a big concern for us because, of course, when we fish, then we're going to end up taking that mercury into our systems and who knows possibly causing toxic effects to us as well. So another threat to biodiversity is the idea of habitat alteration and fragmentation. Now to alter a habitat simply means to change a habitat. And again a lot of these different species whether it's a plant or an animal you change any aspect of that habitat 
and it's going to have detrimental effects to that organism. And what we typically do is we take the habitat and we develop it in some way. So of course you're significantly altering that habitat so the organism can no longer survive. Now to fragment the habitat simply means to take the habitat and break it apart. Now over here on the right is a good example of habitat fragmentation. If you notice right down through here we have a stream or a river and a lot of the organisms that live along this river or stream again they have a particular habitat that they need in order to be able to survive. But if you take a lot of this vegetation and let's say you break it up, maybe you develop it, maybe you just destroy it, then a lot of the organisms that were originally needing access to this river or stream no longer have that access because you've broken up their environment. Now invasive species is another threat to biodiversity that we often think about. In fact, this is one that we've talked about in class. An invasive species is typically a non-native species to the area. And the unfortunate thing is when they do take to a certain area, their um, populations can increase really rapidly. It's because they don't have typically any natural predators or parasites to kind of keep their populations in check. Now down here you can see some really good examples of um, invasive species. Now over here on the right, this is one that we had talked about in class, the idea that in Florida and some of the southern states, because of the climate, because it's a very humid, a very moist, a very warm climate, a lot of the um, reptiles that have been introduced into the wild, whether intentionally or by accident, have started to multiply. They're not normally found in this area, and what they're doing is they're having a very detrimental effect on the various small mammal populations in that area. Over here on the left, again, in the southern states, um, the introduction of the wild boar, whether it be intentional or the accidental release of these pigs into the environment, they can be very destructive to the vegetation in certain areas of the land. Down here you can see bullfrogs, and oftentimes when these are introduced into various aquatic ecosystems, they can have a really damaging effect on the small fish populations and some various crustaceans that you might find in that area. As I had said, there are many different threats to biodiversity, and we can't address all of them, but one of the major threats right now that is often in the news is the idea of ozone depletion. Remember we had said that the ozone layer is actually a really good layer for our planet because it basically is a layer of gas. Remember, ozone is just a form of oxygen that's about 20 to 50 kilometers above the Earth's surface, and it's important because it helps to absorb very harmful UV radiation from the sun. Remember we had said that UV radiation can cause cancer. The unfortunate thing is that large holes in the ozone layer have developed over the north and south poles of the Earth. And these holes in the ozones have been caused by various CFCs being released into the environment. And these CFCs, these compounds, are being released by aerosols, coolants, and even the making of various different types of products like styrofoam. We had talked a little bit about global warming in our 6.1 and 6.2 screencast. Remember, global warming is simply the increase in the average temperature of the biosphere. And oftentimes that increase, as we had said before, is simply caused by a release of those various different types of um, gases that might contain CO2 into our atmosphere. And what this does is it sort of um, exaggerates the greenhouse effect. Because remember, the greenhouse effect is something that's good for us because it helps to keep our Earth warm. But when you burn fossil fuels or when you cut down trees, this is going to increase the amount of CO2 and other types of greenhouse gases in the environment, and that's going to trap heat. And of course, when you trap heat, that's going to cause certain organisms not to be able to adapt, because to adapt to something takes a long period of time. A good example of this would be the increase in temperatures on the polar ice caps. And these polar ice caps are melting at a much accelerated rate, and it's basically a good indication of climate change that might be occurring. And when those polar ice caps melt, of course, we know there are certain organisms, like the polar bear that you see up here in the upper right, that can't adapt to that. And so, of course, that change in temperature is going to have a really bad effect on their ability to be able to survive. And so some of the evidence that we've gathered over many years is simply looking at the change in temperature um, over that time. And basically, from the evidence that we've collected, even as far back as the 1860s, the 1870s, if you think about to the year 2000, as you see on this particular graph, it's pretty evident that there definitely is something going on in regards to our planet. All right, so that's going to finish up our very last screencast for Chapter 6, and please remember to make sure you complete your screencast notes before you come to class.